So, hi everyone, thank you for having me here to present my work. Um, so, I'm Diane Lefoude. I'm um, been in the Hoffman lab for four years now, working on um, RNA sequencing mostly. And my main project was to determine, like, how determine, determining nuclear export kinetics revealed a wide range of value associated with immune response genes. And so most of this project was, uh, at least the data was generated uh, as part of the ribonomics group with a lot of UCLA lab involved in. Um, so there's many steps involved in gene expression, but often when people like think about gene expression, they only kind of think about like transcription and uh, mRNA PK, at least for the mRNA part, which is the part that I'm mostly um, interested in and so but there's like way over a lot of other steps that are involved and that might play a role in like the output we get in gene expression so um, one uh, one of these steps is splicing and splicing has been shown to affect timing of gene expression um, and like release from the chromatin compartment as a, as a limiting step to um, gene expression. Um, but there are also some um, work suggesting that pre mRNA could be degraded in the nucleus and mostly um, by the exosome complex. And that, if you, that could compete with splicing. So for example, if some pre mRNA um, splice uh, more slowly, then they'll have more time to be targeted for degradation. And then in the end, you'll end up with less mRNA compared to some pre mRNA that could splice more rapidly, then they're not going to be targeted um, for degradation, and then you'll end up with more mRNA. Um, so, so my main question was, um, does the effective transport rate determine the level of chain expression. And so what I call effective transport rate is from um, chromatin to cytoplasmic. So how fast it goes and how it affects chain expression. And the couple of questions we had was, um, is this transport rate like standard uh, across all gene or is it something that's very gene specific? Um, and if it's gene specific, is it determined um, by is it determined intrinsically, like by chain structure, motif, or by the context? Is like by like epigenic information, um, priming, or yeah, cell context? Um, does it mostly kind of control the responsiveness or of gene expression? And if so. Um, or does it control the level of gene expression, for example, by modulating the export efficiency? Um, so that's kind of the question I want to answer. And to be able to measure that, we needed to have an um, exper experimental system of inducible gene. Um, and so um, during the Rubenomics project, uh, some colleague generated um, macrophage. Um, BMDM, so use BMDM be, uh, stimulated with um, lipid A because it's um, when you stimulate macrophage, it produces a very strong uh, immune response and activates hundreds of gene in um, like hundredfold or thousandfold. So it induces a very, very strong immune response and um, a lot of gene are induced. Second thing we needed to have to be able to measure that was to quantify um, the different mRNA, so nascent nuclear mRNA and also mature cytoplasmic RNA. So we needed to uh, measure chromatin associated RNA, nucleoplasmic RNA, and cytoplasmic RNA. And then um, we needed like to use a mathematical model um, to be able to infer kinetic rate and so a couple of math equation. Um, so first, um, during the Rubenopnik project, very high quality, high resolution experimental data was generated. Um, so experimental design was to um, 
uh, grew macrophage and then stimulate them with lipid A um, and then uh, extract the RNA at a very fine time course. So like almost every five minutes at the beginning and then a bit more widespread. And then for each time point, um, the cell will be fractionated into free compartment um, to get chromatin associated RNA and nucleoplasmic RNA and cytoplasmic RNA. And so what we can see, for example, on the TNF gene, which is induced, is that for the chromatin, uh, we still have a lot of intronic reads, like here and some also here. And then we have way less on the nucleoplasmic fraction. And we can see that, for example, it's fully spliced on the cytoplasmic fraction. And basically we have that for a lot of very strongly induced gene, um, like over 200 genes for which we can see the response. Um, so, and we selected gene that were very highly induced and relatively rapidly induced to, to have like early response gene. Um, so then um, we needed to fit a mathematical model to that. And so basically what the model, even though it's relatively simple, um, what it includes is um, the input would be the chromatin associated RNA, and then it includes the release rate from chromatin to nucleoplasmic fraction. Um, and then it has the export rate from nucleoplasmic to cytoplasmic, and also the degradation rate from uh, in the nucleoplasmic, and also the um, half life of the mature mRNA. And so, with that, there is like two main uh, measure we can um, derive from these parameters. One is the effective transport rate, which is a combination of these three parameters, so the release rate and export rate of over export plus nucleoplasmic decay, and the export efficiency, which is just export rate here over the export plus nucleoplasmic decay. And so with that, what we did was to input parameter and to um, Fitting them, we take as input the chromatin, um, we smooth it, and then we simulate with this model um, the nucleoplasmic and cytoplasmic data. Then we can compare we can compare to the data using um, Bayesian um, method and having a cost function, and then we get the best parameter set um, for this model to fit all gene. So we'll have one parameter set per gene. Um, and so fitting works quite well. Um, if we compare simulation with data, we can really see much difference. I mean, there is a couple of genes that fit a bit less well, but most of them fit really, really nicely. And you can see an example also on the right. So we have different replicate, but we also fit it separately. Um, and we can see that it match very well. So we can fit quite nicely our data with this model. Um, and so now that we fit all our data, we can look at what the parameter are and try to understand what's happening. Um, so for our parameter, what we can see on the distribution is first that K2 prime um, and K deg um, are quite wide. So it's like um, two, four, two, to unit in log 10, so it's like a hundredfold. So they're quite widely widespread um, across genes, while K1 prime and K2 are kind of narrower. Um, and we can see here also with confidence interval. Um, so we have like the export, which is um, quite reproducible between our two replicates and also has narrow confidence interval. So um, very reproducible and same for the uh, mRNA half-life. Um, K1 prime, so the release rate and export plus nucleoplasmic decay is slightly less well-defined. I mean, at least not for all gene. Um, if we kind of subset the one that are um, better defined, they're also quite reproducible and that's represents like half of the gene. Um, so we also can, can estimate quite accurately um, these two for like half of the genes. Um, 
And so when when you have when you fit a model, usually it's good to have like external data to kind of confirm what the parameter value you get are meaningful. Um, and so what we did, we also had actinomycin D RNA sequencing data. So actinomycin D is um, a transcription inhibitor. So basically by doing a time course after actinomycin D addition, you can see only the mRNA decay. And then from that, you can infer the half-life. So analyze this data and I compare it to the result of my um, simulation. And they also quite match relatively well. Um, as we can see here, it seems that the model has a bit of um, higher dynamic range. Um, so it gets slightly shorter half-life and longer half-life, but overall the uh, run correlation is quite strong. Um, and it's kind of um, confirmed that the fitting procedure did work decently. Um, and so now that we have that, we can look at really what's uh, matter to us, uh, which is like the effective transport. And similarly, it's quite widespread. If we look at effective transport, it's, from, it's also hundredfold between the different genes. Um, and we can see that it's quite uh, well-defined and uh, very reproducible between our two replicates. Um, and if we look at like a gene example, we can also uh, notice that even though these two genes reach kind of the same level on the chromatin uh, and the nucleoplasmic one is way more um, expressed in the cytoplasmic fraction than the other. So the one with more transport ends up being more expressed on the cytoplasmic fraction, even though it's even slightly less expressed on the chromatin fraction. Um, and so first part of the conclusion is so the effective transport rate seems to be very gene specific and varies like over hundred fold change, um, which is quite wide. And so then, um, actually, let me go back. Um, then we can look at, wanted to know if this is um, something defined more intrinsically or, it's, or if it's context, context dependent. So we'll look at different virus measure um, first thing is like function. If we look at the gene that tend to have more effective transport, we tend to see genes that are key inflammatory response genes and transcription factor, such as gene B, FOS, EGR1 or 2, and so on. And the genes that are uh, more toward the low transport side uh, tend to be more genes that control tolerance, like NFKPV2, NFKPV IA, and so on. And so then we also look at different um, intrinsic and gene structure to compare with the transport. So what we can see is that this transport does correlate quite uh, strong, correlate with length. So the longer the gene, the less trans effective transport it has, and the shorter it is, the more the faster uh, transport will have. And similarly, it's also correlate um, even more with the intron number. So the more intron there is, the slower it gets to get transported and the less it has, the uh, faster it gets transported. And, um, and so we also measure splicing in the nucleoplasmic uh, compartments. So how we measure splicing is by looking at intron read on the nucleoplasmic plasmic fraction versus um, exonic read on the junction. Um, and basically we kind of as assumed that every intron was uh, independent, in independently spliced. And so basically we multiply um, the splicing fraction for each intron. And we can also see that that's correlated quite nicely with the, even better with the effective transport. So splicing seems to play a role or be linked somehow. Um, and we also look at some motif um, and these are quite interesting. So we look at how often some motif were appearing um, in our gene in the five prime meteor um, and compare that to the effective transport. So it's a correlation between like how strong and how many motif there is um, in the five prime meteor versus our 
um, effective transport. And what's come up are a lot of these HNR and PA, uh, which are um, protein that are part of the HNRP uh, complex and that mediates nuclear export. Um, so, and they're also sometimes linked to splicing, but that seems to be a lot of um, protein that are linked to transport and um, with seems to see more of the mot their binding motif in the five from each year was a gene with higher transport. And we also wanted to look at uh, context. Um, so what's, it's known that some epigenetic mark, um, like, are associated with um, active promoter, for example, these, or active or inactive enhancer, or active transcription, and so on. So we also measure cobalt um, isomark. Um, so these four here, like H3K4 trimethylation, which is an active promoter mark. Um, we also measure H3K27 acetylation, which is an active enhancer mark, and H3K36 trimethylation, and H H3K79 uh, dimethylation, which um, are active transcription mark. And so we compare that to our transport, and um, we don't see very strong correlation. Um, so it doesn't seem to, at least it still more doesn't seem to um, be associated with uh, more transport. And we also look at priming. So we also had data um, that had, uh, that so macrophage that were tolerized uh, with lipid A before a second lipid A stimulation. And so what's mostly um, C is a reduction in induction. So as we can see on the left. Um, so in the naive case, we have a very strong induction and in the tolerized case after priming, um, we have a not as strong induction, um, gene induction. And so if we compare transport, we can see that it's mostly similar to the naive case, even though given that the induction was less, um, it was harder to fit. So the confidence interval tend to be bigger, but overall it's still kind of within the twofold as it was um, before. So we don't see any particular effect of priming on the um, effective transport rate. Um, so uh, for this part, um, so the effective transport rate doesn't seem to be context dependent, but seems to be more an intrinsic property of the gene. And um, then we wanted to see how, it, if it controls or responsive nephro gene and or level of gene expression. Um, so there's been some report that half-life is um, linked to the responsive nephro gene so um, in the Baltimore paper, um, they show three group of genes that are induced after stimulation. One is very transient and very rapid. Another one is a bit like uh, intermediary response and one is more long-term response. And they also look at half-life and they see that all the rapidly induced genes tend to have a shorter half-life than the like intermediary response gene and so on. And on this paper from OLAB also, they showed that having a longer half-life, you'll tend to see a peak that's um, later compared to having a shorter half-life. Um, so we also uh, look at that with more data. So we kind of try to simulate um, within the range that we observe for gene, um, the responsiveness as measured by the time to half maximal uh, to step function. And what we can see is that it's mostly dependent on the half-life, even though the other parameter, like the speed of the transport does um, affect slightly uh, the timing. And so what's happening is that um, the two main parameters that will define um, the responsiveness are the transport rate here, the K2 and degradation rate. And so basically it's the slowest of the two that's gonna uh, define the responsiveness. And for what we measure for all our chains, the slowest of the two is the KTX. So 
for autogen, we could measure basically the half-life is really what controls the responsiveness. And so also here we plotted like all, we simulated all our genes with their estimated parameter and compare their um, time to have max so responsiveness, time to have maximal to their half-life. And that definitely seems to uh, be the correlate a lot versus um, comparing the responsiveness to the effective transport. So we also see some kind of correlation, but not as nicely. And so the responsiveness seems mostly determined by the mRNA half-life. Um, and so then we wanted to see if it's controlled by um, like the export efficiency. So we look at the export efficiency and it's also widespread, but not as much. So it's more like a 10 to 34 compared to 100 fold. Um, and for, for the gene that we could measure it, uh, it's also reproducible, quite reproducible. And we see similar effect um, than before. So basically, even if uh, some gene reach similar level on the chromatin, the one that has uh, more, that is more efficient in terms of export than tend to has more higher cytoplasmic expression. And so if we compare the transport to the efficiency, it's actually correlated quite well. So it seems that the effective transport is mostly controlled by um, the export efficiency. Um, so yeah, so yes, yeah, the controlled gene expression and it's mostly modulated by export efficiency. And as um, kind of summary, if we look at um, transport versus half-life, we also see quite a strong correlation. And what we think is happening is like gene evolved to be um, very responsive, at least some immune gene. And by doing that, that would have tend to lower their expression. And so you need it somehow to compensate for that. And the way to compensate is to increase um, transport. So as a conclusion, um, transport rate vary, vary quite widely, 100 fold and seems to be very gene specifically. Um, they seem mostly to be an intrinsic property of the gene and not to be context dependent. Um, and half-life uh, controls the responsiveness of gene induction. And so efficient transport ensure that the primary immune gene response and that have shorter half-life are still expressed at quite high levels. Um, thank you. I'd like to thank uh, some people in the live that help or generating data and the ergonomy group. Um, yeah, and if you have a question. Thanks, Diane. That was great. Sorry I was late to introduce you. It's okay. <laughs> Are there any questions for Diane? I have a question. If I can Great. help them. Um, good talk. Uh, I was wondering if the rate of transport changes based on the age of the animal or days in culture. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how old the mice were. Uh, couple of weeks, I, I, but it was, they all were the same age, so I don't have any comparison mm -hmm. for that. It, it would be interesting to look like over development if transport goes up in early development and maybe cools down a bit later on. Um, thanks. Hi, Deanne, this is Doug. Hi, Doug. How are you? That was really nice. Um, I had a couple questions, if, if it's OK. Sure. Um, um, one is I was interested in your model that you used a, a, a term for degradation in the nucleoplasm, but you don't have one in the chromatin. And I was wondering, uh, why not put one there? Or, or does that not have a big effect on what you might see? Um, so the way I did it, I uh, measure. So chromatin is our input. And yeah. so I measure only um, full length transcript on the chromatin. So basically, I kind of assume that all 
the chromatin that uh, is measured and full down transcript is ready to get cleaved and released into the nucleoplasmic. But so I didn't put any degradation rate and it wouldn't, I mean, to do that, I would have need, need to really have transcription rate. Uh, right. So kind right. of to start one step earlier, right. which right. would have brought another, um, like I would have need maybe transcription factor signal to yeah. like include that step. So that's why I didn't include that. Because I, I think it's an open question of how much decay occurs uh, in the soluble nucleoplasm versus um, on chromatin, you know, in, in soon, as soon as it's something's getting transcribed. So it'd be interesting if one could model that. Um, yeah, I think it's had quite some complexity. Basically, mm -hmm. uh, you need to start with transcription factor and kind of one step earlier yeah, yeah. than what I did. Uh, and then so, I was wondering, but, but just to clarify this point, so Diane, I think this is not a compound degradation rate that you're measuring, right? It's it's not a compound. It's not both chromatin and nucleoplasm. No, it's it, really nucleoplasm. It's just nucleoplasm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the data suggests that really for many genes, ninety percent of the transcript is lost in the nucleoplasm. Huh. Yeah, I, that a, doesn't mean remarkable, how many is lost on the chromatin. A remarkable but... loss of efficiency. So, so that, that, that's that's another question I had. So so you so ninety percent. So so if you're producing a hundred transcripts on the chromatin, and all of them get to the nucleoplasm, ten will get into the cytoplasm. Uh, for for yeah, for some gene. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, slow. show the graph again, Diane. Yeah. Um, the efficiency graph. Uh, like this one? Like yeah. the distribution? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so it's like definitely more than a tenfold. So it's 10, 30 fold. So for some genes, probably like 5% five, 5 that are left. 1%. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe. I mean, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you the graph on the right, right? You've got a gene that's got yeah. 0.5 and another one at one, minus 1. Yeah. 1.5. It's, yeah. it's 100 fold. Yeah. yeah. And most gene are kind of here, but a few are a bit further. So, so your transport efficiency is everything from the, the whole process from uh, chromatin to its exit into the cytoplasm. Yeah. That right. Um, there are some data um, where, and this is only on individual genes, so it's not, um, it, it, it's not, um, you know, necessarily the rule. But uh, there's data from um, Rob Singer's lab where they concluded uh, using single molecule microscopy that export was quite quick, quite fast. Um, but just the step across the membrane, the nuclear envelope. And so I, I was wondering if, if you assume that everything, was, that that part was very fast, um, how does that change your, your model in terms of um, what you can say about the, the speed of the earlier steps? Or, or do you think that, that that step will be slower on certain genes than others? Um, I guess here mostly what I can say is that like to control this efficiency, it's basically that the degradation that's happening at, uh, on the nucleoplasmic fraction is much faster. Like if the degradation in the nucleoplasmic fraction is much faster than the export, whatever yeah. the export is, then you'll still lose a lot. Um, yeah, so, but what about things that hang out in the nucleus and neither export nor get degraded. So, so it might be interesting to look at, um, uh, there's a few examples. I mean, you, you, you mentioned Amy's stuff, um, but there are also, um, and, and then the Baltimore um, introns, but there's also, uh, these aren't in macrophages, but a set of uh, introns called detained introns, where this is a paper from Phil Sharp's lab, uh, two papers, um, where, 
RNAs get transcribed, they get mostly spliced, they leave one intron in, and that hangs around in the nucleus as kind of a nuclear pool of material for later gene expression. If, if some of those were expressed in your, um, in macrophages, it'd be interesting to look at them. See him. Yeah, I haven't looked at intron specific, so I kind of look at splicing in general by combining all the introns and haven't right, looked at- Right, but it could like, be transcripts that are known to have these introns and therefore yeah. stay in the nucleus longer than others. Yeah, yeah I could try to look at specific gene. Um, so you have this correlation plot between transport efficiency and splicing. No, uh, oh, oh, right, that one too, right. So there are some. I mean, that one's sort of some outliers, right? So there are yeah, some. Yeah. So for example, um, there's some outliers that have. Uh, that re retain introns yeah. to, the, to the, what's the left. Yeah. But and so same, it's like combined. So the more introns, the lower it's gonna go down. Right, so, so we need to- From, from um, the, what are called detained introns, you know, to distinguish them from retained introns that might be exported. Um, yeah, they, they would be in that lower left end of, right. your, of your plot. Yeah, I would, I would need to look at specific gene, um, but it could be interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a, a, another comment. Um, yeah, very interesting talk. I think it would be very nice to, to link your analysis also uh, with respect to the nuclear architecture. You know, where are these genes actually located in the nucleus, especially uh, relative to speckles, for example. So there, there is, um, you know, data from the Bellman, an experimental method from the Bellman lab called uh, TSA SIG, uh, which measure, measures actually the, the mean distances uh, between any gene and uh, and uh, uh, speckles. Actually, the closer they are to the speckles, the, the the efficiency of the splicing, of course, enhances dramatically. And but we can also predict those actually from high C data in our uh, modeling. And so I think it would be very interesting to look at that, you know, uh, in terms of um, the efficiency of the splicing and, and transport and so forth, you know, depending where the, these genes are uh, most often localized in the nucleus. And the other aspect is the efficiency of the uh, export. I think it would be interesting to look at uh, RNP binding sites. Maybe there are certain proteins that are enriched in those RNA that are uh, more easily exported from the nucleus. Uh, because at the end of the day, what is exported is, is a protein complex of the, of the messenger RNA, and, and maybe there are certain binding sites that are enriched. You have now the data of how... Yeah, so I, I look at, I look at um, the 5 prime UTR and 3 prime UTR, and I see some um, protein here that are um, involved in transport, and they seem also correlated with um, the efficiency. And the... And what's known about these proteins? I think you've looked at that, right? Some of these um, proteins are known to play yeah, a role. Yeah, they're not to be involved in the mRNA transport from nucleoplasmic to cytoplasmic. Um, yeah, like this one, the HNR and PA one, and um, these two also. Definitely the HNR PA. I need to probably look a bit more in detail, but that seems to um, be correct. And so what I did here, I look at, um, the number of um, motif compared to in the vibram here compared to um, the transport. So, I, and so that's the correlation that's here. Um, so, in the five prime UTR, you found motifs that are associated with fast transport, suggesting that these proteins are promoting transport. And the three prime UTR, you found motifs that are associated with slow transport, which you don't show here, but because we don't know what to make of them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, but, but it appears that slow transport is the default. And if you want to transport fast, then you have to evolve something. You have to evolve a smaller gene. You have to evolve fast more efficient splicing, and you have to evolve potentially 
a binding site for one of these RNPs. Uh, the three prime UTRs, you would predict that um, you would find AU rich elements because the very rapid ones tend to be rapidly degraded. And, you know, this is a classic FOSS, you know, kind yeah. of um, decay, decay rate, you know, for a rapidly induced gene, you, you need a rapid decay rate. And so the, those. Um, yep, Diane found those. Yeah. Yeah, I found some of those in the proofing ETR. Yeah. Yeah, okay. There's another question. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you for the talk. That was a really great presentation. Uh, I was curious if you have looked into maybe tolerance of variation within each gene and compare that with um, your estimated transport rate, like um, maybe genes that are more tolerant to variation uh, are exported faster, um, are tried more often. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but. I'm not fully sure I understand what you mean by genes that are more tolerant to variation. Like what, uh, what type of variation do you mean? Like, Like population variation, like like genes that have more, um, yeah, that 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 have more mutations in the population. Um, yeah, like for example, in humans, you have the PLI scores that is like how tolerant they are to like disruptions or like genes that. Um, Yeah, that are very conserved in 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 the population of um, the species or across species. Like there's there's um, statistics of like how conserved the gene is, and like I wonder if you have compared that with your transform. No, I definitely did not compare that, but that's I guess a good suggestion. Um like to see if some of these more conserved gene tend to be like the slower transport or, um, hmm. but yeah, no, I didn't, did not look at that. It's a good idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Diane? Good, that was a great discussion. Thanks for the input. Uh, yeah, thanks. It's nice to be at the point to be presented, present a, the work in a way that people can can uh, follow and ask questions and engage. It was fun to see the data kind of coming to fruition after a lot of other meetings <laughs> long, long ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So we'll we'll tidy this up a little bit and a uh, little bit more, but I think hopefully we'll be able to draft something soon. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks so much for your input and uh, uh, have a great Friday.